Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We've got a very lively discussion that's going to take place concerning the management of dialysis access during this uh, COVID-19 environment that we have. This is fortunately a, a grant was uh, by Medtronic is going to help us do this by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education. Now, uh, at the end of the introductions and some of the um, presentations we're going to give, uh, there will be a very nice Q&A program that will follow that. And I'd like to introduce or have them introduce themselves of our panelists who uh, most of you will know. Our first one is Ari Kramer. Ari, tell us a little bit. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Medtronic, thanks for sponsoring. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Ari Kramer. I am a uh, vascular access surgeon here in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And uh, we're going to share our experiences with you, and I'll pass it off to the next. And Charmaine. Hi, my name is Dr. Charmaine Locke. I'm a nephrologist in Canada from the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm looking forward to this session. Thank you. And Mani Wasi. Hi, my name is Dr. Mani Wasi. I'm an interventional nephrologist here in Chicago at Rush University Medical Center. Looking forward to a lively hour. And Terry Litchfield. I'm a patient advocate, Blanchardville, Wisconsin, whose husband was 46 years on dialysis, home and in center. So I'm here to represent the patient and excited to be here. Well, in starting the discussion, we had a preliminary on this done two days ago, and I learned an awful lot and completely refocused on what we were going to do. And the things that I came away thinking about this over the past couple of days were these four issues. In doing dialysis access, what is the philosophy, the people, the place, and what are the politics involved? And depending on the, our individual philosophies were that the procedures that we're doing, they're not elected procedures. Whether we're doing creation, maintenance, or salvage, and certainly abandonment, these are at least an urgent procedure. So what happened was the medical community really got educated that the things that we were doing in dialysis, these were not procedures that were elected. This was a big deal, I think. The place where they were being done, the procedures, were they being done in an office base, a hospital base, or HOPD, uh, ambulatory surgery made a big difference. And also the politics. My goodness, the politics changed all over the place, local, state, and national politics. So we'd like to discuss, I think, these four particular places where access takes place and the things that are surrounding this. So we'll start with my situation and then we'll kind of go through the crowd. I'm at an HOPD. It's in Central South Carolina. Our philosophy was send the patient, we will take care of it. We had an education program there, which COVID shut down. We had an education and training program for doctors, which COVID shut down. But we wanted to take care of our patients, which means send the patient, we will take care of the patient, even in the COVID-19 era. So what happened, we set up in a very elaborate program outside our center, whereby a screening process was done with the usual type of screening measures. We actually had a conduit for the potentially COVID or COVID patient room. We have six operating rooms. And so they would have a, in the designated operating room, the same anesthesia, the same nurses, and then there was an exit where these patients would go out and then we would determine where they go. So what happened as many of the places dialysis being done were shut down, we were as busy as not busier and it worked out very well and the patients got taken care of very well. We had to educate the nephrologists, we had to educate the dialysis centers, but we also had an education program for the patients. Things are back to normal right now, but we're still screening just as we did before. But as far as inside the building itself, other than screening the patients, everything has gone on just as it has been going on. We did not get shut down. So we'll look at variations on this theme. I think, Ari, you have something that you'd like to tell us your situation a little bit different. Yeah, um, you know, we have a, a very similar experience, you know, uh, John, um, not too surprising. But in, uh, in my area of, of northwestern South Carolina, we are a uh, level one trauma center and our hospital administration some years ago invested quite heavily in the uh, belief system in taking care of dialysis patients 
uh, which was fairly unique in our in our area. And um, as COVID came to play, and you know, and, and that the pandemic started to rear its head, and we started to understand how the vast implications were, and CMS became more involved, and, and elective surgeries were um, put to bed. Um, it, it became very clear that we had to craft strategies to educate, as you said, um, our many partners to be sure that the patients would be well cared for. Um, and so I initially uh, you know, created a letter that discussed with the nephrologist and the clinics what we were planning to do uh, to support the patients, what procedures we thought would be available and would not be available. So we, we mass emailed that and text messaged all our uh, pertinent partners to let them know that we would be available for business. Um, however, CMS uh, at that time had, had issued a letter that made it unclear whether or not we would be able to perform uh, procedures as we had because of uh, the pandemic, uh, with urgent emergent not being a clear designation at that time that dialysis access was in fact urgent emergent procedures. And so despite my plan, I had to then reapproach administration uh, with the administration, um, pardon me, with a letter from CMS that revised that statement that re recaptured the fact that our procedures were urgent emergent. And then suddenly we had uh, maximum capacity again and we were able to take care of the patients in a very streamlined fashion. And much, much the way that you had hinted at, we, um, we created pathways uh, as we were an inpatient hospital center-based practice. We created safe environments and safe pathways for the patient to enter in with screening protocols that began outside the hospital and then would navigate you uh, through a, a se separate corridor and hallway to maintain a appropriate distance between patients and the rest of the hospital system where patients might become uh, in, in contact with patients who otherwise might be ill. And we also had a separate recovery basis for those patients to really isolate it, understanding that our patient population is probably one of the highest, if not the highest risk for carrying disease uh, back to either nursing homes or the facilities in which they dialyze. Um, when we did that, we, we found out that uh, not only were our outcomes markedly improved, but we also had to deal with then the environment of other systems that were a little bit behind ours. Some systems closed their doors and were not as proactive in developing a similar set of strategies. And in fact, we had an outlining OBL uh, that it shut its doors and we ended up capturing some of those patients as they came to us. Um, and the things we ended up dealing with were really the dynamics of the, the testing environment um, were the hardest pieces for us. How to keep clear who was going to be uh, going as a person under investigation and isolating those patients to PUI rooms or COVID rooms versus not. And that, that became the, the really the hardest part, which had to do with the antibody testing, et cetera. Um, but once we overcame that, uh, really we got back down to basics. And the basics were uh, the patients had urgent emergent needs and we were going to treat them aggressively and leverage the technologies that we have known about that were um, going to give the patient the broadest and biggest opportunity to remain away from the facility as long as possible. So um, not only using our outpatient telehealth screening processes, but also when patients came to us, we did do a fair amount of leveraging with DCB. And we also, in, in certain instances, when ORs became a little bit scarce and concerns uh, for having patients go in the rooms, you know, um, percutaneous fistula was also an opportunity for us. So we were fortunate that we had a hospital facility uh, and administration that allowed that as well. Um, as far as our processes, you know, the day-to-day -day ultimately, I think, defaulted back uh, to the leadership of our community. Uh, the ongoing dialogue between surgeon, nephrologist, clinic, patient, having those pieces be well uh, orchestrated really allowed us to continue on and provide a large number of perineal dialysis, 
catheters so that patients could stay out. We, the, the care became much more specific and focused in a way that we really didn't experience uh, pre-COVID. And I think so a lot of positive messaging and a lot of positive collaboration allowed us to continue to uh, turn out very healthy and well uh, cared for patients who were able to continue their dialysis in the safest possible way. And um, ultimately, that's what we did. So I'll, I'll hand that back to you. And if there are questions about, you know, further elements of what, you know, what you might want to know, we'll, we can touch on that later. Very nice, Laura. Very nice. Charmaine, would you like to comment, please? Sure. So I actually come from a hospital-based uh, facility. So just to give you some background, we have a, over 400 chronic kidney disease patients who are not yet on dialysis or transplant. And we have around 330 uh, in-center dialysis or satellite dialysis patients. And we, had, we have separate processes for both CKD patients and dialysis patients that were affected. When this first came about, um, all uh, surgeries were shut down unless they were emergencies, so ruptured aortas, things like that. And that had an immediate impact on our chronic kidney disease uh, population. We have a very, very strong home dialysis um, policy, and a lot of our planned PD patients were not able to get their PD catheters and ended up um, starting with a, a catheter on hemodialysis. And part of the reason about, of that is because our surgeon actually came back from a high uh, COVID positive place and had to be self-quarantined, and he was the main person putting in our PD catheter. So while this was happening, our hospital then opened up to um, essential surgeries, and it, made, it was made very clear that access, vascular access, as well as vascular access, uh, was an essential service. So then we had our interventionalists uh, put in PD catheters to help that situation. Um, for our CKD patients, because dialysis modality and access is so critical, what we did was we had three tiers. So we had um, our nurses go through our list of patients to see who could we really see uh, that was necessary in person? Who could we um, have clinic visits with, with teleconferencing and, and video conferencing? And then who could we just have telephone calls? So we continued on our, our clinics to maintain that social distancing to make sure that everybody had um, what they needed. In terms of hemodialysis, we always maintained our vascular access care. We have uh, two vascular access coordinators. Um, and because vascular access was deemed an essential service, initially the creations were put on hold, but they came back on. Um, all of our angioplasties, um, all of the necessary procedures required to maintain access were continued on. Just like our, we, we had a very uh, stringent uh, screening in place. All of our patients were screened. Patients from long-term care facilities would get screened on a regular basis because we had uh, outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. And if somebody was COVID positive, they would be isolated um, in their own area and as well have their own transport. So through the COVID uh, scenario, we've actually been able to maintain our, our dialysis uh, the way we uh, usually run it. We have um, three dialysis shifts, and we also have an overnight dialysis shift where people come to the hospital to sleep, to sleep overnight to have nocturnal dialysis, and that's also being maintained. So it's been a lot of uh, coordination, a lot of communication between the physicians, the surgeons, the interventionalists, uh, the nurses and technicians, but we've been able to keep our patients on dialysis and uh, very much uh, COVID-free. Charmaine, thanks a lot. That was great. Monty, tell us what happened up in your part of the woods. So I, uh, I'm an interventional nephrologist and I live in Chicago. So as you might imagine, uh, I'm at an urban center. Um, I'm at Rush University Medical Center. And we, uh, Illinois had a stay at home order that started on uh, March 21st. So um, COVID surge started really shortly after that. And in my hospital, my procedures are done uh, in the hospital, but the patients are obviously in outpatient status. And I mean, it was, it was the typical scenario that you've been hearing about our MICU and our CICU and, and our NICU turned into a straight up COVID units. We ended up finding another 46 ICU beds that we created, and 
it was really all hands on deck with many of the people uh, contributing to the inpatient services um, because there was such a flood. I think Rush was taking care of at some point 23% of all of the uh, critically ill COVID patients in Chicago. Um, and we now have the county that has the largest number of COVID cases in all of the United States. So uh, we were under both state orders, but we were also under orders from the Illinois Department of Public Health, which stipulated that there was no way we could actually start back with doing elective cases unless there was a certain bed uh, uh, capacity that was met, what, that was reached. And that really just started on May 11 of uh, this month, just about a week and a half ago. Prior to that, I was used to seeing patients that were coming in from the community, uh, from a variety, probably 10 to 12 different practices that I was getting, that I would normally get patients from. And as soon as COVID started and uh, patients quickly recognized that the hospitals were in many cases inundated with COVID patients, they all just vanished. And uh, the majority of our patients ended up getting sent, very appropriately, I believe, to outpatient dialysis access centers where they could really get expedited care. They wouldn't uh, take the risk of getting uh, exposed to COVID, at least inside of a hospital. And um, they, they could get back to dialysis largely the same day. So um, our cases just dried up. And the only things that were done were considered urgent to slash emergent. And those were basically declots and catheters. Uh, and a lot of those were catheter conversions because we had a very high uh, dialysis rate of uh, our ICU patients. So uh, the month of April, we averaged around 70 to 80 ICU COVID ventilated patients, and very heavily COVID here. And uh, that's now declined into the 30s, um, but our whole hospital has basically been COVID. So it's just now in the last week and a half that we've had a return of patients. I typically read the surveillance of patients that are affiliated with our dialysis unit here at Rush. Uh, I didn't, haven't gotten numbers in three months because everything stopped coming out of the dialysis units because I think people were really stretched thin, staffing was stretched thin at the units, and their focus was really on taking care of patients and ensuring that um, they weren't <laughs> getting COVID uh, in their dialysis unit. So we're kind of just turning back, returning back to normal now and we still have a stay at home order so that i think is restricting patients movement to some extent we're hoping that that's not extended for a third time uh, and that will be ready to go back the first of june but that gives you a flavor of a city i mean it's nothing compared to colleagues that we have in new york uh, which is a fraction of the number but i think our numbers are more on par with boston and some of the cities in michigan that really got hit hard well, Okay, so to give the patient perspective, when the president told everyone to stay home to really flatten the COVID curves, the dialysis patients stayed home. Many of them missed treatments in those first few weeks. And it was through the kidney care community and the CDC and CMS that very quickly the dialysis situation changed such that dialysis units set up similar to the hospital screenings. And in a case of suspected COVID or known COVID, each region had an unaffiliated dialysis unit as known as the isolation unit. There were a number of problems, and Dr. Wasse, you hit the nail on the head. Patients at all costs want to avoid hospitals. They don't want to get COVID. They don't want to be next to people with COVID, and so, the dialysis community quickly sent that message. And I will say early on, there was not good communication and the kidney patient organizations very quickly did membership flash surveys. And we gave the feedback to the kidney community that the patients are worried because they aren't getting the information they need to keep safe from COVID. So as an overall view, uh, the, lat the latest CASER data less than 5,000 known cases in ESRD populations. And so that's a real testament to the success of the isolation units that are still now in play. A patient who is in an isolation unit has to um, test negative um, and be totally symptom free to go back to their unit. Inside the dialysis units, they have managed even in some tight quarters to get six feet between chairs. But some of the things that patients rely on, like 
transportation services? Are churches providing rides to and from dialysis? Frankly, those fell apart. And there were severe transportation problems for patients who were confined to COVID units because Uber, um, Lyft, even the Medicare services knew the address of the COVID unit and they did not want to service those locations. And so for the patients, they absolutely want to stay out of any care setting. We are hearing early now that even as we are on the downslide of COVID, the dialysis units, because of their fragile population we're talking about, will likely continue to have certainly social distancing, but in many cases, the more frail patients will still have um, social isolation. I think that one of the things that came loud and clear were the use of some of the technologies like telehealth and vascular wellness calls, things that allowed outside of the dialysis unit, because they were in dialysis units three days a week, and it's a, it's a team that they know and they felt comfortable with, and, and everybody's used to the mask and the gowns and the, and the routine. But now it's very important that providers do a really good job of educating a patient why what they have today, if it's not clotted or infected, why it's still urgent. And it's to try to get a patient to understand the pathway that if you don't take care of this cannulation issue where you're having difficulty and it's obvious from your clearance or something wrong, that you really do need an angioplasty. I will say that one of the other things that we are hearing a lot of questions about, now it's, it's really too early to talk about it because we still have many situations like Illinois still shut down many states. We still have the situation in New York. Um, patients are very interested in home treatments. And it's, it's some of the first times we've actually hear, hear patients actively talk about home because they are hearing and reading and seeing on the news that there is a possibility that COVID will reemerge in the fall. And so there is a general, genuine overall in the patient community fear uh, when a patient would leave to go to a COVID isolation unit, there was a sadness. And now what we are seeing as for those of you who may have heard that some of the COVID patients who were not kidney patients before they got COVID, they have COVID related acute kidney injury and are on dialysis. And now they're going back, they are, they've survived COVID and they're going back to dialysis units, but they aren't always very welcome by their fellow dialysis patients and it's fear. And so as much as all of you who are providers can take the time to educate, use the patient portal in your electronic health record, L use your telehealth, use wellness visits, check in with patients that you haven't seen. And it's been really interesting that some of those wellness checks will uncover other issues not related to dialysis access, such as my foot is swollen and I have a sore. And so giving that feedback back to the dialysis units and the nephrologist can get the care for what could be an infection or a cellulitis. And so it's really collaboration being the key. And so I'm very, very happy to say that despite early reports that there was going to be an overwhelming, we, think, we thought about our dialysis units and the spread of infection, but that isolation and truly community collaboration of isolation units has really led to exceedingly low infection rates in our patient population. Now for transplants, I, I feel like I have to, to give that update. I read, sadly, the UNOS report, 50% of the transplants in the last six weeks have been canceled. And the, and the, the idea behind that which it was very hard, um, but you know, you get a cadaveric kidney in and it has a certain shelf life. And the, the risk of having a patient in an operating room, for example, Monty, with, with as many COVID infections in your ICUs, a post-transplant, the decisions, hard as they were to, 
to bypass those transplants have really disillusioned a lot of patients, especially those who had living-related transplants scheduled. Those were all canceled, um, and, and ter certainly appropriately so. But now getting them back on the schedule is, um, it, it's really a waiting game and finding the slot and, and getting it back in sync. So thank you all for the, for the care of the patients and the innovations in care that led to some unexpectedly good outcomes. Terry, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things I think maybe Ari and I could address is did we change our operations because of COVID? We certainly did because we did not want to do two and three stage procedures anymore because we don't know how long the COVID era is going to last. We used a tremendous amount of immediate stick grafts even to the even to the point of putting an immediate stick graft and getting the catheter out, especially if the catheter has been there a period of time. We also, as was mentioned, look at other technologies. For instance, with the drug-coated balloons, certain places they really do a much better job than a plain old balloon angioplasties. And even stent grafts, sometimes we would not necessarily use them the first time around, but now we would do that because we really don't, would like for that patient not to have to enter the center again. Ari, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, you know, John, I, I agree with you. I'm sorry my video is frozen intermittently, and so I heard a good bit of your audio, but not everything. Um, but I, I think as far as the processes, I agree with you. You know, we adjusted our processes um, a, a bit heavily. You know, we, we leveraged the data that's been emerging and has been quite promising, uh, most particularly with the DCB in that arena. And we've been gratified by doing that, uh, by treating patients who had... Uh, aggressive lesions, um, and then keeping those patients out of the hospital. And, and our numbers have really shown that. And I think um, where we were normally seeing those patients with more regularity than with plain balloon angioplasty, when we were using you know, these DCBs, uh, we were able to keep those people away, which was very fortunate in this environment because we did inherit a very large number of patients, both with COVID-based uh, disease, uh, and their renal failure that was associated with that, as well as mentioned other systems patients that came to us. And so had we um, been unprepared and, and not leveraged ourselves in such a way, we might have been in a very different circumstance. Um, so that, that was a, a terrific boon you know, to our uh, program and our ability to handle some unexpected volume, to be frank with you. I was expecting not to be doing cases, and we went from not doing cases you know, for two days to suddenly, you know, my practice is every bit as busy, if not busier than it ever has been. Uh, and the unit of work to get some of these things done because they haven't been a part of our normal maintenance is probably up about 20% per patient rather than what it was uh, pre-COVID. And that has to do with, I think, some of the screening breakdown uh, in the outpatient centers, uh, which, which is not terribly unexpected. Um, you know, and, and we've also, again, we've, we've, we've hit on the edges with a little bit of uh, percutaneous fistula as well, trying to eliminate the amount of time that patients are in the operating room to achieve a fistula. So um, we haven't done quite as much with, uh, with immediate stick grafts. We haven't been in that position, but certainly uh, we've seen a very large uptick in peritoneal dialysis requests from nephrologists and patients. A lot of this care has been driven by the patient and, uh, and has been directed by a much more informed patient base than what we have typically seen. And I think that really speaks volumes from the care teams outside the hospital, the nephrologists, uh, as well as them directing uh, patients with much more uh, specific desires and, and awareness of the environment that they're in. And so really I applaud everybody's efforts in, in um, in their interest in keeping the patients first. And, I, and again, I echo that back with my hospital administration where uh, honestly it was, it was rewarding where you, you knew that we, we were a valued service, but honestly the only services running in our hospital, which is again a level one trauma center, were the trauma team and access. Uh, and so all the other service lines were essentially um, minimalized uh, where hours were continued because to keep a, a dialysis patient in the hospital from a failed access can translate to 11 days of a hospital stay. That was just national average. 
uh, and so to risk a patient with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and the other comorbidities, and, and their ability to contract this illness would only uh, undermine the hospital's ability to serve the community well, um, and because these patients would then act as vectors as they were discharged back out into the community, and then uh, subjecting their families and, again, other members of their community uh, in close contact to risk. So I think all of the collaboration has, has really been incredible, and I'm looking forward to being in a post-COVID environment and maturing some of these processes that were uh, honestly quite refreshing to see in the midst of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you, Art. That was great. A question popped up concerning which DCB to use. We use both the DCBs, but we found out if we want longevity, we'll use some type of scoring device and then use the DCB and the results, particularly at cephalic arch and juxtanastomotic area, seems to me much better. So that question that came in, hopefully that will answer that. That's just my preference, a way to do that. Monty, maybe would you like to comment on that at all? Cute. There we go, unmuted. Um, I don't have a DCB preference. Uh, I, I'm waiting for some additional publications to come out of the most recent um, trial that was touted that seemed to have very good success. Uh, but I generally avoid them in the cannulation zone. I tend to use them at cephalic arch locations where I don't want to stent or in the central veins. That might be problematic with regard to stenting or having an extensive amount of recoil. Very good, very good. Now, I think, do we have any questions uh, coming from the audience? Money, I think you were going to manage that. Yep. So there was a question uh, which I, I wasn't quite clear on, but it says, what technologies are you utilizing most for your dialysis patients now? And I attempted to clarify that as to whether or not the questionnaire was asking about inpatient dialysis technologies or surveillance technology in outpatient units. And it sounded as though they're talking about inpatient. So. I'll start. I mean, the, the majority of what we're using inpatient on dialysis patients that are that have COVID are if the patient is critically ill in the ICU. It's usually some form of CRRT, lots of different names for a version of that, or SLED, depending on the number of dialysis uh, you, uh, machines you've got versus uh, versus CRRT machines. I know we. Uh, in my hospital, we had 15 machines each, and we cut the CRRT times um, by to, to nine hours so that we could dialyze as many patients as possible. Um, some of our colleagues in New York took a different approach, which I thought was very inventive. They had a huge volume of patients that was beyond anything I've ever heard of. I mean, they were dialyzing 150 patients or 200 patients in the hospital. And they were actually doing continuous therapies so as not to try to, to waste time changing the machine out um, repeatedly. So everybody has a different model, but it was about resource utilization, keeping track of ensuring that you had, you know, good anticoagulation so that you're not using up cartridges for the CRRT machine and so on. And there's a lot online. So for the questioners who are interested in that particular topic, I'm not sure that's the scope of this particular talk, but there's a lot online about uh, how people have managed their resource use and what techniques they've used to dialyze patients. Again, dependent on what's happening in your neck of the woods. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions you see coming up, Bonnie? I, I, have, a, I have a question on that for Dr. Ross, because I know that there are some new home devices for remote monitoring of the access. I've seen those. Have you have you tested any of those, or even have you seen any of the new fancy stethoscopes that perhaps allow a dialysis unit to hear a stenosis? Dr. Kramer, Dr. Wasse, Dr. Ross, have you heard of any of these new types of devices? Oh yeah, we're, uh, actually, Terry, that's a very good question. We are actually using that. There's a company out there right now that's in the process of developing a stethoscope specifically for home dialysis, where indeed it would, it would listen to the frequency. And there's a protocol you go through, and you'll be in the red, yellow, or green. And then we're actually going to do a study showing that indeed what we're hearing and what we're seeing on the angiogram are the same, so we can have confidence interval that, that what we're hearing and what we're seeing are the same. There's also some telemetry things in the work we're doing a study right now where we're placing chips below the fistulas and the grafts so we can get direct flow from the graft. We can actually get that by ultrasound and or 
uh, is being worked on by telemetry. That's going to be in the future for, for sure, Terry, no doubt. Yeah, because I think that what I'm hearing from patients all over is the more that can either be done at their dialysis unit or certainly, you know, the uh, advancing American kidney health goal says that by 2025, most patients are going to be transplanted or on home therapy. So as much as can be developed for those would be really welcome. So looking forward to hearing more of those. Okay, there's several questions here. Um, one of them is, are patients being tested for COVID before their access procedure and is it required? Um, I can speak from my home institution and in my state. The, the Illinois Department of Public Health is requiring that patients get tested um, who are coming in for uh, elective procedures or surgeries. And because the con in the context of that, they're requesting that that happen within 72 hours of the procedure. They're also requesting that the patient self-isolate following that testing in uh, just leading up to their, their intervention. And, and I've made the point with my hospital that that's not a possibility for dialysis patients because they have to go to dialysis. So we're utilizing point of care testing for patients. Uh, so once they come in, they come in 15 or 20 minutes earlier than, their, than, than what they would typically do. They're getting uh, uh, point of care testing and then we're moving forward with doing the procedure. I just want to comment on something that uh, Terry mentioned about, you know, the patient's fear um, when she first started. And that is really true. One of the things that patients are afraid of is that they're not going to get their dialysis if they fess up and say they have symptoms. And that screening is really, really critically important. So it's, I think it's really important. I think um, Dr. Kramer was talking about really educating the patients. And we sent newsletters out and we actually had personal communication with the patients to say that you are going to get your dialysis but you need to tell us about symptoms so that we can protect you as well as your other, the other patients surrounding you. And we, we gave our patients masks uh, and really tried to support them in reducing their fear so that they could have dialysis. And they were also going to come to the facility to their angioplasties, again, for the same reasons. And just with education now, patients are very comfortable coming into the hospitals to get their procedures, knowing how to uh, you know, uh, properly use PPE and, uh, as Mani said, to do the screening as, as necessary around the procedure. So I think that patient education and, and collaboration with the team is really important to get their work done. Um, and also, Terry, you know, in our unit, at least, we still continue to monitor our patients' access. So, you know, while the development of the stethoscope is happening, we still have our, our nurses and technicians uh, do the monitoring of their access on dialysis. And we still have our nephrologists see our dialysis patients as, as they should, even with, um, you know, the stay-at-home order, because dialysis is deemed to be a, a life-sustaining and necessary procedure. Um, so we are still monitoring our accesses. So there's several questions here, and I don't know, John, if you want us to touch on those, but there's one question that fits right in with your response, Charmaine. Can you talk about remote monitoring? How are you currently using it, if you are? And do you foresee utilizing uh, it to uh, continuing uh, after the pandemic is over? Terry, I don't know if you want to comment, uh, comment on that as well, since you're linked up with a lot of the different units around the country. What I have to say is patients like some type of remote monitoring, but I would agree they have comfort when they go into their dialysis units. And it's mainly the home patients I'm hearing about, you know, will, will, I, will my access still be checked because they aren't going into a dialysis unit. Um, and so just a, an overall interest, they don't want it to fail when they're at home. So, uh, Terry, we have um, about 130 home hemodialysis patients in our program that do nocturnal dialysis. And they're taught, um, they go through an eight-week uh, training period to, to determine how to provide themselves dialysis. And in that, uh, they're also taught how to monitor their access. So they are taught how to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, they will come in uh, with the full screening and, and protection if they have issues with their access. So I think the key thing is really good education until we have this uh, teleconferencing. And we are doing uh, tele teleconferencing uh, to be able to evaluate the patients during this time. Yeah, home dialysis is going to be very important of what's going to happen 
who's monitoring the access? Because the access frustration factor that the home dialysis patient can feel, we've got to eliminate that as much as possible. Because right now, the dysfunctional access, obviously, is identified in, in center. So I think some of these devices, Terry, as we have already mentioned, are going to become very important in the future so these patients can self-refer themselves when they start identifying things that they think are of a problem. I think that's certainly in the future. So several questions here, some of them not related to COVID, so we're going to stick to the ones that, that actually are. Um, there's some questions around, have you noticed whether or not there's an increased infection rate uh, in catheter, in perm cath patients, and is there any thought of placing catheters tunnel catheters in the ICU on COVID patients to limit the need for transportation to the suite or uh, need to check temporary access. Um, I think most of us would avoid, so the majority of our patients that landed in the ICU on the ventilator went through some period of being prone and uh, they were really sick. So the thought of, and they got secondary infections as a result of being prone and uh, having tunneled lines and non-tunneled lines, triple lumens in their neck. So people would, were truly loath to put in a tunneled catheter at this stage. Maybe that's a little bit contrary. Maybe they would have done better with the tunneled line, but there was a lot of uncertainty because these were majority AKI cases as to how long it would take for the patient to require dialysis. So temp lines have been used exclusively in these patients. Uh, and you know, uh, I would say that I, I didn't see any significant increases in infections at my unit, but I don't know that that's data has been made public. I'd ask the other members uh, on, the, on the panel whether they experience that at their hospitals. No, there was no increase in infection rate money that we noticed. But the other thing about temporary catheters, I think that's a great idea, obviously, in an infected patient. But occasionally, temporary catheters don't work really well. Right. And in that particular case, we, would use a, we may use a tunnel catheter, not as a tunnel catheter, may use as a temporary catheter to get the split tip, symmetrical tip, and that kind of thing. So. Uh, but we don't tunnel it. So that's yeah. something just to think about if you can't get the temporary catheter work appropriate. Yeah, it's important to note, that's a great point. It's a, even though there's a higher cost associated with it, it's important to note that most temp lines only come in 15s and, and 20s. 15s are usually used on the right IJ, 20s are often used on the left. But in patients that are prone or who are big or shaped like apples, the line generally is too short oftentimes, especially if it's a left IJ. So use of a tunneled line but not don't tunnel it just use it for its added length can be very beneficial especially in patients that are repeatedly clotting which is what we find in the COVID patients so it's a little bit of creative use of a more expensive line but it might save you on the price of changing out your cartridge because it's not going to clot as readily yeah, I was just going to say that's actually what we do, um, but the issue is that the hypercoagulability of these patients in the ICU, so there is a lot of catheter exchange. Uh, another question is around, um, oh, what sort of technique are you using for percutaneous vascular access, Dr. Kramer? Not sure how pertinent that is in this particular COVID era, but uh, I think there's, some there's, a, there's a question about that here. Yeah, I couldn't hear. Was that directed to me? Yes. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Uh, right, it's really look, broken. Look at the look at the Q and A list. So there's a question about yes. the type of percutaneous access that you're using at your unit. Okay. Uh, presently, we're um, we're using the ellipsis uh, system, and we're uh, in our infancy still here. We're a bit green, um, but we've we've certainly seen some promising results there. And uh, we're going to continue to explore that opportunity as uh, patients sort through to us for that. Great. So, John, I'm getting a note about Charmaine being ready to talk about the guidelines, which I think are part of this uh, discussion. Charmaine, I don't know if you wanted to move towards that now. Yeah, that would be great. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see it. Um, so, let's see here. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Right. So I'm going to talk about the KDOKI guidelines really briefly and uh, COVID-19. Um, it's not advancing. Okay. So the overarching goal of the guidelines is to achieve reliable functioning complication-free dialysis access to provide prescribed dialysis while preserving future dialysis access site options as required by the individual patient's ESKD life plan. And I think the key thing here with regards to 
COVID is to provide that reliable and functioning access and to really preserve that future access. So to be careful when thinking about putting in that catheter because it can uh, lead to increased central venous stenosis and um, be problematic for future AV access use. So really, you know, the, the focus on providing that function. So how, how are we going to do this and um, meet that goal during these COVID times? And it's still the same thing as the guidelines recommend, is to have that plan, to have that patient life plan. And the life plan talks about hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. And as we heard already, how important peritoneal dialysis is and that peritoneal dialysis catheter, particularly in the COVID times where you may want to stay at home. The really critical is that access needs and, and the components of that access needs is to have that creation plan, that contingency plan and that succession plan. And here in these COVID times, that contingency plan is really, really critical. So what are we gonna do when that access you know, that AV axis has a stenosis. How are we going to provide that angioplasty? Are we going to go to an outpatient unit? Are we going to be able to provide it in hospital? What are the ways that we can protect our patients and our staff during those procedures? And again, underlying all of this is the ongoing vessel preservation plan to keep in mind avoidance of that catheter if possible. Um, and just to remind you that on March 26, the CMS actually came out with um, a clarification of their prior statement. And this was in regards to, um, with regards to the feedback that they got from societies such as ASDIN and VASA, and where they said that providers are experiencing difficulties scheduling for placement or repair of AV fistulas, grafts, PD catheters, and uh, central venous catheters. They said, we wish to clarify that these planned procedures are essential in that establishing vascular access is crucial for end-stage kidney disease patients to receive their life-sustaining dialysis therapies. So we have support from the CMS to say that vascular access is essential and we need it to be able to provide that life-sustaining therapy. They also recognize said that this would be um, established these catheters, but risk significantly higher infection, morbidity, and mortality. While recognizing this, there will be instances in which local conditions will not allow for these procedures to be done due to resource constraints related to the public health emergency. And then that's where, you know, comments that um, Terry made are really important. That how can we um, use innovation? Uh, like, with regards to specific, I'm just going to uh, share a um, karaoke guideline. The guideline 1366 does not recommend pre angioplasty officials with stenosis not associated with clinical intake to improve access patency. However, they do then state that they consider it reasonable for patients with consistently persistent clinical indicators to undergo preemptive angioplasty of their AV access to reduce the risk of thrombosis and AV access. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that preemptive angioplasty is very, very important when we do have clinical indicators. And it's very important to look for these clinical indicators. And so we have to still, even in this COVID times, look, listen, and feel. And hopefully with new technologies like that stethoscope that Terry commented on, we can have that listen uh, comment. So really important to educate your patients to you know, help them help us identify these uh, accesses with clinical indicators. I mean, then just to say that, and I'll, this will be my last slide, that we really do need necessary interventions to maintain that AV access reliability and function, which is really the overarching goal of the guidelines. And some of the comments around angioplasties are, you know, Kado, he considers it reasonable to use balloon angioplasty with high pressure as needed as the primary treatment of AV access uh, stenos stenotic lesions that are both clinically and angiographically significant. And before we had the results of some randomized controlled trials, uh, you know, we had to say that there was inadequate evidence to make a recommendation using um, spe special, uh, specialized balloons, drug coated. Um, or cutting versus the standard uh, angioplasty balloons. But because we knew that innovation is really important, we did say that we found that it is reasonable to 
have a careful patient individualized approach to the choice of balloon type for angioplasty, which includes drug coated balloons um, for clinically significant um, AV access stenosis. And that would be based on the operator's best clinical judgment and expertise so that you would have people like Dr. Kramer, or Dr. Ross and Monty to be able to choose the right balloons for that situation. And I think if we do have um, you know, drug-coated balloons that are going to increase that patency of that AV access, you know, this is the time to, to use it, you know, particularly since you don't want to have a lot of uh, visits um, to these facilities to have uh, repeated angioplasties. So I'll, I'll leave it there um, and leave uh, the rest of the discussion for the, the panelists to talk about you know, how we can uh, use technology uh, to uh, continue providing reliable access and, and to reach the KDOKI goals. Okay. So that's all I had to say. <laughs> I mean, just the question as to when the article was, when were the KDOKI guidelines published and where can the audience find them? Okay, so they were published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease. And if you go onto the American Journal uh, of Kidney Disease website, they're actually available uh, online for free. You can actually download the PDF. So look at AJKD. Are there any more questions out there? There are a few. There's one from, uh, uh, well, I think we've, we've pretty much answered these. For those of you who are on the, the call, please go ahead and type in your question. I have one for Terry. And Terry, you know, you, you were married to somebody who was on dialysis for 46 years. You're one of the most savvy individuals around the dialysis patient population and, um, and really a patient advocate. And, you know, if, you're, if your, husband, your late husband was still alive and uh, you were obviously very involved in his care, what would be the location that you would feel most comfortable bringing him if he had a problem with his vascular access? I know he had a fistula for a very long time, but what would get, and, and why? Why would you make that, that selection? So we actually chose for the last 10 years of his access, and he had 37 accesses over 46 years, including some of those old Scribner shunts. But um, he chose a free freestanding access center that had published some data that actually had, had excellent outcomes. And he chose it because he did tend to get sepsis from other medical conditions he had. And so he always felt more comfortable that he could control the surroundings better when it was a smaller environment and he knew the staff and he knew, he knew who was going to be performing the procedure. And so, I would say that when a patient has a choice, and there's actually published patient satisfaction data that of patients comparing hospital experiences with freestanding experiences, and it's very similar to the ASC literature. Patients prefer more convenient, smaller settings where someone will call them by their name. And so um, that would be the choice. That would, that would be where I would choose to take him for his care. John, you run one of those centers. Uh, is that what you're finding from your patients as well? They're really comfortable going to see you for those reasons? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we know the patients by a first name basis. And even though we're an HOPD, we're disconnected from the hospital except by a corridor. So they're not entering a hospital. And in our particular situation, there's nothing in AV access we don't do in the building. So even if they come in, maybe with a clotted access that is difficult to declot or impossible to declot, we can do surgery at the same time. So being able to offer this with the patients knowing that, knowing that the greatest likelihood, no matter what, they're gonna leave with a running blood access, I think is very, very important. But the patients feel very comfortable. The nurses know them, the doctors know them. Uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a hometown kind of thing. And th I think this is very important. These patients, by and large, sometimes when they get in big hospitals, my belief is that they get somewhat neglected. They're pushed around. Uh, we don't do that. That's all we do. All we do is AV access. And I think that's a good thing. I think uh, 46 years of living on dialysis, somebody got the dialysis access right, didn't they, Terry? They absolutely did. So can I just comment? I mean, I'm, I'm from... Uh, 
you know, your, your northern uh, partner, and we don't actually have outpatient vascular access centers. So you're very lucky in that regard. Um, but what I'm hearing from all of you is that you really need a facility where there's a dedicated person that's knowledgeable with expertise in, in vascular access. So it could be this outpatient where you have wonderful Dr. Ross, or it could be you know, an inpatient facility where you have someone like Dr. Kramer. So as long as the operators and the team is expert and really knowledgeable and committed to dialysis access, I think that's really the, the crucial point. Yeah, I would agree with you, Charmaine. You know, we, um, our, our center is not a freestanding center and we don't have a disconnect uh, through a pathway or a walkway to uh, an adjacent building, but we have a very close team and a very close team and uh, we have our own separate hallway, et cetera. And so, um, you know, we are also equally familiar with our patients in a, in a very homey way. Uh, and that I think makes the relationship uh, between the staff and the patient that much more familiar and we provide as much of an outpatient environment uh, or an OBL type environment, freestanding environment as possible. Um, we, you know, I'll tell you there are many times we've, we've enjoyed being in the hospital because there are plenty of comorbidities that catch you by surprise and you need, you know, the ologist. And so, um, you know, on, on the one hand, I think there are some trade-offs. Uh, I definitely, if, if I had my druthers and I had all the, the capabilities, um, I think I'd like the OBL environment. I'd like the, the personalized environment, but I sure would like also to know that if I'm falling, I can get caught and, and uh, be cared for completely as well. So it's definitely a balance in there. And, and, um, and so I just think there's a lot to come from this. So there's a question. So John, if you'll click on Q&A, there's a couple questions that are specific to a comment you made, but aren't necessarily specific to COVID. I'm gonna skip to the one that's COVID. And I'm, for those of you who typed in your question, Dr. Ross will probably answer those for you. Um, via uh, typing, but there's a question around PD and which I think is really pertinent and it's asking whether or not there's been any enhanced adoption of PD with COVID uh, given the concerns of patients wanting to avoid hospital and employ more use of, of home modalities. Yeah, that's true. We did see more patients coming and being referred by the nephrologist for PD. We don't know how long the COVID era is going to last. And many of these patients were set up to have some PD some, at some point in the future, but we did see, as I think ours saw the same thing, an uptick in uh, PD, and it's, it continues on. And a lot of places in South Carolina, they, sh they were not doing PD at all. And so we saw them coming from l very long distances away, 100, 150 miles, just to get a simple PD catheter put in. Yes, it went up. So um, Dr. Altman, Great to hear from you, Dr. Altman, typed in a question and he's made the point, uh, Sandy, if you uh, saw us for the first couple minutes, I think we may have addressed this, but it's worth reiterating. He makes the point of asking whether or not if COVID respikes, isn't it worth uh, considering that the vast majority of these cases can and should be performed outside of the hospital and freestanding facilities where they're available and uh, to limit things like PPE use and exposure of patients to inpatients. And Sandy, I, I, I think we all agree that that's the case. Certainly in my, in Chicago, we've been sending patients to, uh, to freestanding units because it's um, that, that's who stayed open, uh, particularly with the rules in Illinois uh, uh, mandating uh, 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 shutting down elective cases. And you know, every place is different with regard to what they consider an elective case, but my hospital, they weren't having it. They were just doing declots and catheters. So yes, we, I think all of us would agree that that's probably the best place for patients during this time. Well, I think you still have to have the same uh, precautions and use of PPE regardless of whether you're in a freestanding facility or in hospital. It, it, it's still the same procedures. No, that's true. But given the given the complete and utter, you know, uh, tight hold on PPE within the hospital, at least many of the places that ended up getting a big surge, there was a huge emphasis on a minimal number of individuals attending to the patient, and uh, and there was concern around that issue and and conservation of the PPE, which was what prompted a lot of people to want to send these patients out because there was uncertainty around how long the surge would last and how much PPE was going to be available given the competition of the other hospitals that are in the, in the city. So um, that's, I, I, think, I think every city is different with regard to how they were managing their, their PPE supplies. Yeah, I think uh, what we, 
our thought process was by having the tents, the corridors, all those kind of things, separate operating rooms, the different conduits, getting your patients in and out. We wanted to be a lot safer than the dialysis center they were being dialyzed in. And so this was something that we, that was kind of going to be a baseline of we really being better than the dialysis center. Not so much the hospital. We certainly beat the hospital. That was easy. But I think um, that, that was kind of our goal. And I think we accomplished that. But we just have to, you have to have the place to do it where you can get in and out of the facility with, and being COVID safe. I think it all gets the, the summation of probably the biggest lesson we all learned, the importance of communication, communicating with the surgical teams, the dialysis teams, and the, the patient and their families and transportation. And I think that in the post-COVID environment, if it does re-emerge, which we, I think we all hope it does not, but if it does, we will be better prepared through the better communication channels we developed in the middle of the pandemic. Said well, said well. Okay. Are there any other comments? We're reaching seven o'clock my time here very closely. Anybody else, any comments? John, I don't have a comment, but I know that this individual is wanting an answer. So if you can give a short answer. Why do you use a, why do you use a scoring balloon before you use a DCB? And have you been, uh, are you using DCB technologies uh, in outpatient labs? If you can just give an answer to that. Somebody's really hungering to get that information from you today. I did a study, and I'll give the answer. I did a study using uh, protocols that had been used on DCB clinical trials by scoring first the identical clinical trial by scoring and then using the DCB. I'm not using scoring by itself. I don't think it works that well. But scoring plus DCB seems to work really well, so we have data to actually show that. It's really expensive. I'd just point that out. Um, and, uh, and are you getting paid to do it in an outpatient lab? That's, a, that's the second part of this question. No. Okay, great. Even more expensive then. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I guess I would have to say from the patient perspective, one avoided intervention was a value. Mm -hmm. So it depends on which side of the equation you assess the cost and the value. Yes. Uh, that, that's very true. Very true. Very good. Very good. Oh, okay. uh, one other, one last thing, John, because uh, yeah. I've been told we have one more minute. Um, with increased coagulability due to COVID, have you seen AV fistulas and AV grafts clots increased? I asked this very question while I was in the ICU a couple of weeks ago. And in Chicago, we have a little multi-group uh, dialysis uh, WhatsApp group where all of us got together and we're asking and answering questions around dialysis. And surprisingly, we have not found that to be the case. Tons of catheter thrombosis, but, and I think that part of that's positional because as what we pointed out before around the length and everything, but not fistulas and grafts. And it's likely because of the high flow. Um, I don't know, what, what, are, what are everybody else's experiences? Exactly the same thing. We didn't see yeah. any increase in clotting at all. Yeah. Okay. I think that's, I think that's the group. That's, those, that's the, those are the questions. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. What fun we have, and hopefully we can do this again. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye.